So to continue, and, and, uh, and this is really the end, is uh, deploying on hardware and mobile, which also includes this thing called interchange formats. So the unique problems on deploying on embedded systems um, or mobile systems is that the, the frameworks that are available to you are usually less fully featured than full-on you know, PyTorch or TensorFlow that you're able to use in your training. It might be maybe you don't even have a framework or maybe you just have a kind of a limited framework. Because of that, we have to be more careful than we otherwise would with the architecture choices we make. And uh, a thing we may give thought to is an interchange format, which I'll talk about in a second. And uh, also embedded mobile devices have usually le way less memory and slower uh, processors than servers. Because of this, we might have to reduce network size. We probably want to quantize our weights, which means like kind of reduce the precision of the numbers, and potentially actually train a whole new network um, that distills the knowledge of our full network that now doesn't fit on the smaller device. So to start with, we can talk about mobile frameworks and, and weight quantization. So TensorFlow, so both TensorFlow and PyTorch have a way to deploy to mobile. The TensorFlow way used to be called TensorFlow Mobile, and it was widely considered to be uh, painful. Um, and you know, for example, you would have bugs converting your TensorFlow model to a TensorFlow Mobile model because now the layer um, implementation was different and like had a different, it just processed your, your network differently. And so there, there were all kinds of bugs that you would only see in mobile. Um, and also it was a very limited set of layers. But they've replaced that with TensorFlow Lite, which is sold as a smoother experience and uh, the way it works is you convert a TensorFlow model into the TensorFlow Lite format with TensorFlow Lite Converter, and then you have a .tf Lite file, which you can load into the TensorFlow mobile framework on your mobile device, which will then run it. And optionally, you can also quantize your weights, which are usually 32-bit floats. You can quantize them down to a 16-bit or even 8-bit, 8-bit um, integers even, to run on yeah, so there's a lot of stuff there, and it's hard to say things that are general enough about this because every platform is going to be different. So mobile is different from embedded systems. Embedded systems with a GPU are different than those without, and um, it's hard to say. So the, the best we can do is kind of point you to the framework and, and just let you know that they have things for this. So in PyTorch Mobile, you train your model in PyTorch, which executes a Python code path, which obviously you're not going to want to run on your mobile device or embedded device because you really don't want to run Python over there. So you can optionally quantize your weights first with a quantization.convert. But the real you know, heavy lifting is done by TorchScript, which is this torch.jit.script, which takes your model and, and essentially compiles it from a flexible you know, Python code path to a static execution graph, just like the old TensorFlow execution graph, and then saves it in, in the TorchScript format. And then additionally, PyTorch provides libraries for both Android and iOS. So there's libtorch for iOS and uh, PyTorch Android for Android. So that, those libraries can now load the TorchScript model and then serve it. The feature, it's not feature parity. There's going to be models that you're able to train in PyTorch that you will not be able to convert to TorchScript. And uh, a way to, actually gonna go back to this slide, a way to think about it is thinking about some kind of global interchange format for deep learning models. So the best one we have is the Open Neural Network Exchange, Onyx. It's an open source format that a bunch of companies signed on to. And basically the, the dream that people had is, hey, wouldn't it be awesome to train in PyTorch where we can just write Python code but then compile it down to something that can just run in C++ on you know, the smallest machines we have. And to achieve that, they added an interim step, which is this Onyx thing. So it supports multiple frameworks. It has converters from uh, N2, you know, MathWorks, MATLAB, uh, CoreML, TensorFlow, and it has different runtimes. 
So here is like a Microsoft uh, slide from this, for example. So you can take models trained on any of these frameworks. If you can convert them to an Onyx model, then you can deploy them then on a bunch of Windows devices or iOS devices or you know, whatever else. So the mental model to have there is that this Onyx model is only capable of holding things that are defined in the Onyx definition. So if you did something super weird in your PyTorch model, if you can't convert that to an Onyx interchange format, then you probably can't deploy it on the um, other targets. Specifically for mobile, there's also you know, uh, Core ML from Apple and then ML Kit from Google. These are more not for interfacing with PyTorch and TensorFlow, but kind of like keeping things in their own ecosystem. Um, uh, Google is a little better at interfacing with TensorFlow Lite. And then there's uh, startups of which FritzML seems to be the most promising that basically tell you like uh, you can convert your model once and then Fritz will make it work with both CoreML and MLKit. The reason you want to use this stuff is because the primitives are optimized. So like if Apple maintains CoreML, they'll make sure that like all the you know, deep learning operations or the core ML operations are going to be fast on all of their phones. Uh, lastly, for embedded devices, we have um, NVIDIA. So there's NVIDIA GPUs that are low power devices for small robotics applications or just putting somewhere an embedded system. What you usually do is you, you quantize all your weights, so try to get your model size to be as small as possible because you don't have that much memory. So that means converting to float 16, maybe even 8-bit. Um, and then there's other things that Tensor RT is the library that helps you do things that kind of optimize for those embedded GPUs. Um, so these are kind of like things about engineering. There's also things you can do kind of upstream of that. So for example, you could try to reduce the network size. And in computer vision, there's a, um, a publication called Mobile Nets, which observed that you know, the standard convolutions that are done, there's spatial connections, and there's kind of uh, channel dimension connections. So a standard convolution is, let's say, a 3 by 3 connection in the spatial dimension and a dense connection in the channel dimension. One by one convolution and inception architectures kind of mix and match the spatial dimension. So, like, so sometimes it's just a one by one convolution densely connected across channels. Um, and inception mixes one by one convolutions with three by three convolutions. A mobile net has a, um, separates out the steps. So like the, the spatial step is separate from the channel wise step. And because of that, it uses a lot less memory. And if you just replace you know, your convolution operations with that architecture, um, you can reduce the number of operations you, you do without really dropping any accuracy. And furthermore, you can kind of tweak. You know, this paper gave you like a little knob to tweak. Uh, you can get your network to be like really small and drop accuracy or approach you know, state of the art, but still use less computation. So the last thing you might want to do, I just give that as an example, how to reduce network size. And then the last thing you want to do is be able to distill knowledge, potentially. And knowledge distillation, this refers to you know, training the first network. That's like the real complicated network. You train that on the data set directly. And then you start calling it the teacher network. And you use the teacher network to train a smaller student network, which is not training on the data. It's training on the predictions of the teacher. That's the way it is, and I think a good case study um, is pretty recently published by Hugging Face, which is a source of a bunch of these cool NLP um, language models. And so they took BERT, which is this huge, huge model uh, published by Google, uh, and they made